Um, I think that probably we need to, um, uh, rather than just sitting before, also before we hemorrhage and walk people, uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, we should uh, have a little. Uh, uh, I don't know if anyone anyone here has any thoughts on that. Stephen, I can I can I can see you. So I'm sitting here. Yeah. Please shout over there if I'm ignoring you. Uh, you started this extra production with a marvellous monologue from Coming Up for Air, which is one of my favourite novels. I think far less known than, than the others, but I think one of his best. And you ended it with that superb interrogation by O'Brien of Winston Smith. It's always struck me that in some ways, Coming Up for Air is a sort of dress rehearsal for 1984. I mean, George Bowling is a sort of fat middle-aged disillusion, fed up with his wife and children. But he's a rebel, isn't he? He, he doesn't lie down with the trolls. He actually uses the word trolls. And there are lots of words that can't be coming up for which pre-echo 1984. Rubber truncheons. He describes Elvmere Row where he lives full of torture chambers. This obsession of Orwell with torture chambers, rubber truncheons, boots smashing into people's faces. It's almost an unhealthy obsession. So I think there are, there are verbal pre-echoes. But I also think, you know, there's also this element of nostalgia that Bowling has for the for little, for, um, What's it called, that place that he lives? Uh, Binfield. Binfield. That's right. And it, the whole novel is shot through with this, because when he goes back, it's utter disillusion. Um, again, in 1984, there's a dim memory of the past that Winston Smith has through this song, Oranges and Lemons. You played on it as part of the production. There is a sort of nostalgia, even in 1984, for, for a sort of past that's just been obliterated. And when, when, when Bowling goes back, it's literally the past that has been obliterated, isn't it? If that doesn't pre-echo 1984, what does? I think the other thing that, that pre-echoes it is this idea that everyone knows what he's doing, that, that he's got this deviant desire to go back to Binfield, yeah. and the whole world is able to read his thoughts. <laughs> and the other thing about that is that his deviant desire is tiny. It's, you know, it's the you know, want, to want to go fishing. It's not, yes. And, the, and the, that becomes symbolic of everything. Breaking uh, out. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 <coughs> Position to yeah. And I think one of the things I like about, about it is how how much it's a symbol of kind of even the smallest variation actually ends up being the biggest variation, the smallest act of opposition, mm -hmm. the smallest act of kind of disagreement from the, if somebody if people are trying to oppose you like that way, then it ends up being much, much more than that because it, it multiplies upon itself, it makes it bigger and bigger and bigger, and you're, you're forced to oppose those who are kind of trying to restrain you in the way that you probably didn't expect right at the beginning. If, if he'd been allowed to go fishing and everything would be fine, then he would return to his family and face an argument. He wouldn't have that same sort of significance. Can I just make one small point? I don't want to hold this discussion, but Joseph Goebbels, since we're talking about Big Brother, there yeah. was the arch Big Brother, Goebbels said, it's a cynical remark, but it's totally true, that the bigger the lie, the more the public will believe it. Mm. Now that seems to be it's like a theme which runs through coming up for air and day before, because I quote, uh, this came up in the marvellous reading. The beauty of the building society, swindles, is that your victims think you're doing them kindness. You wallop them and they, and they lick your hand. It's easily, that's, that's the, the real horrifying moral of Matt 84. Not just that the big brother uh, 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 crushes the people, but they actually enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, there's, 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 a, there's a lottery where they know they're not going to win, they buy their ticket every week. They know they're not going to win. <laughs> I mean, do you think this is the case, though, with all right. that actually what is slightly frustrated by it is that there's too much compliance and not enough thought crime or deviance and, and so on, but actually, because it is always, it actually is down to the individual to break the fabric of a superstructure by their own sort of oddities and quirks of... Yeah, he's really specific about what kind of oddities are allowed. You know, he hates sandal wearers and bearded people and <laughs> vegetarians and feminists. Frogs, which is... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All Do you people who think, think outside society, but he writes them off because they don't think of outside society in the way that he wants them to. Do you think, I'm just, you know, there's certain words that obviously I shan't say them because they're, you know, they're, they're frowned upon and they, that we're not generally allowed to use today. Proles, for example. Do you, was proles at the time of, the, of this writing, did it have quite, this, you know, was it... Uh, because of course this refers to proletarian, yeah. and uh, and it, actually the, the talking about the proletariat was uh, it was a yeah. the proletariat was a was a glamorous uh, abstract notion for lots of the socialists of this kind of great historical force which would rise up and seize the ownership and means of production and all the rest of it. Um, and actually, so proles is not necessarily kind of the, 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 the thought crime using that word that uh, that we suppose it to be. No, but, but significant that Orwell 
once said that the working class smelt. Uh, that as an atonement, he put on, there's no record of him speaking, none apparently, although he worked for the BBC. But, but yes, but he also put on a sort of faux Cockney accent, trying to mask the fact that he was an Etonian. People, but people saw through this. And he actually, there was a big row about it because he then claimed that he didn't say the working classes smelt, but that he'd been taught to believe that they smelt. Uh, and and, and, and that, he, that, that he was then accused by, I think, the Left Book Club said, mm. yeah, that this is disgraceful that he'd implied the working classes, these noble proletarian smell, and he had to defend himself against this charge and say, no, 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 they don't smell, I was just taught to believe they smell. Um, and then he went and sort of experienced life and described it in a way that led one to the certainty that, in fact, if you're down and out in, in, sort of in Paris and London, that people do, in fact, smell and, you got around it in that sort of way. But, but I think there's no doubt that he did face that kind of thing, because especially coming as, and, and as you're saying, that you, know, you can't read, read Orwell without thinking there is actually a deep distaste for the working class yeah. in some yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. unpleasant, yeah. snobbery. Yeah. And yet he's trying to confront that, and, and you know, Winston Smith in the novel is trying to kind of deal with that distaste and hatred and, and yet believe that that's the only place that any hope comes from. Really. Well, maybe that is his thought crime, which yeah. is yeah. which uh, his work is always is, is astutely designed to cover over. But uh, you've got the measure of him, unfortunately.